I started to realize was that the limitations of the success of the conservation movement were because people didn't have the connection or a love for these places that we were trying to protect. They didn't have an inherent love for the earth or a sense of deep connectedness that I'd kind of taken for granted. So I came to see in a way that unless there was that foundation of connection, it didn't matter how many statistics I threw at them about climate change or clear felling of forests, there was no fertile ground for it to fall on. You're listening to The Good Dirt Podcast. This is a place where we dig into the nitty gritty of sustainable living through food, fashion, and lifestyle. And we're your hosts, Mary and Emma Kingsley, the mother and daughter founder team of Lady Farmer. We're sowing seeds of slow living through our community platform, events, and online marketplace. We started this podcast as a means to share the wealth of information and quality conversations that we're having in our world as we dream up and deliver ways for each of us to live into the new paradigm, one that is regenerative, balanced, and whole. We want to put the microphone in front of the voices that need to be heard the most right now, the farmers, the dreamers, the designers, and the doers. So come cultivate a better world with us. We're so glad you're here. Now, let's dig in. Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to the Good Dirt Podcast. It's just me today. Emma and I are sort of evolving our workflow around production and we challenge ourselves to do what we encourage others to do, and that is to find ways of creating more spaciousness in our lives wherever we can. So if we're taking turns doing the intros every now and then, that gives us more time and headspace for other things, like our bonus episodes, for instance. We just did one on Halloween. Hope you've had a chance to listen to it. These bonus episodes typically come about when a topic comes up that we think would interest you. And so instead of an interview, we'll just get on and talk about it. We don't really claim expertise on anything in particular. We just offer our thoughts based on these years of experience in the sustainability space as Lady Farmer. And after 100 plus conversations here on The Good Dirt, and in our personal lives as well as we try to practice what we preach, so to speak. So we'd love to know what you think of this format, the bonus episode, and also to hear any questions you have or ideas about topics you'd like to hear us discuss or really any comment or feedback at all. And a really convenient way to chime in is to call and leave us a voicemail on our dedicated podcast phone line. That number to call is 443-459-1950. And we'll also put that in the show notes below so you can see it. But really, just pick up the phone any old time. You can pick up the phone right now even and call 443 459 1950 to ask a question, suggest a topic, tell us what we could do better or what we're doing right. We'd really appreciate it. Okay, now I get to introduce this remarkable episode, one that resonates really deeply with me personally in so many ways. But first, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever, in the midst of fighting traffic or checking off your to do list or shopping or struggling with work, Have you ever had the thought, I just want to go live off in the woods somewhere, away from everything and everybody? I'll admit here that I have, but as with most of you that can admit this, I imagine it never goes any further than a brief thought because let's just say this thing we call real life gets in the way of taking that any further. Well, today's guest actually did it and not in spite of real life, but actually more in pursuit of it. And if that has you curious, you'll really want to stick around for this amazing interview with Claire Dunn. Claire is a writer, speaker, barefoot explorer, rewilding facilitator, and founder of Nature's Apprentice, which is a platform for education and guidance in rewilding our souls and the planet. For the last 15 years, Claire has been facilitating individuals to dive deeply into the mysteries of nature and psyche through the pathways of deep nature connection, ancestral earth skills, deep ecology, eco-psychology, soul-centric nature-based practice, village building, dance, ceremony, and contemporary wilderness rites of passage. Claire is the author of the memoir, My Year Without Matches, 
which tells the story of her year living in the wild. And the recently released memoir, Rewilding the Urban Soul, exploring how we might embody wild consciousness even while living in the setting of a city. I personally found so much of this conversation moving and so relevant when I asked Claire what she sees as the common thread in people who are coming to her for guidance in this journey. She responded that in most people, it's a sense of longing of knowing that there's something out there that they're seeking, a connectivity to themselves and their communities and the wilder world. And I think it's that same deep longing that inspires us in the work we do with Lady Farmer and this podcast. And I think it's that very hunger that brings our community members and our listeners to these discussions. As this is really our work now as a human community, and it's the teachers and guys like Claire who are showing us the way. So we're so happy to bring you this conversation today with Claire Dunn of Nature's Apprentice, speaking to us all the way from Melbourne, Australia. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoy. My name's Claire and I'm here chatting about my work in deep nature connection and nature-based soul-centric human development. And I'm the founder of my business, Nature's Apprentice, which connects people in a more deeply way to themselves, to the more than human world and to community. And I've been running this business and offering rewilding and deep nature connection practices for about 10 years now. And this comes on the back of my own exploration into the relationship between humans and nature and how we might live in a more original, animistic, deeply respectful and enlivening way with our world and its wholeness. And there's so much more I could say about what I do and yeah. how I came to be doing it, but I'm looking forward to this conversation. I'm so excited to be chatting. I've heard the term rewilding. I think I understand what that is, but can you tell us what you mean by rewilding? So rewilding originally was a conservation biology strategy, which talked about and enacted top order predators coming back onto the landscape and kind of looking at the landscape in a more holistic way rather than humans inside and nature outside. So rewilding has also been coined as a new human movement, which really speaks to the need to reclaim our roots, our ancestral roots in terms of what are the centerpieces or the foundational pieces of our thriving that we have lost or forgotten in this modern Western culture. So it questions everything from our food to our footwear, how we live, where we put our attention, certainly our relationship with the elements in our life support systems and the more than human world. And it really seeks, this movement seeks to find ways to reconnect with some of those ancestral life ways. Everything from earth skills to growing our own food, understanding edibles and medicinals, but also a, a kind of a, a wild mind, cultivation of a wild mind, a way of being that is generative and connected to more than the human dominated landscape. So it's quite broad and people are using it in all sorts of different ways. I think it's such a great evocative word. Just the word itself is quite stirring for me. Definitely. I love it. Hmm. I love that word. I thought of a wild mind holds different aspects to it, but one of them is certainly, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at the computer screen and I'm engaging with YouTube, but is that all that I'm capable of? Or am I also aware of, well, certainly the weather outside, the changing light? Am I aware of what birds are moving through the landscape? Am I aware of the nuances of how my body is here? And it's a sense of extending our rings of awareness, our tendrils of awareness outside the human dominated conversation. So there's a sense of ecological literacy or curiosity. For me, a wild mind really speaks to a curiosity to what else is happening outside this human conversation I'm having with my laptop or with my housemate. It's looking outside the four walls and knowing that part of our human wholeness is deeply connected to the myriad of life forms around us, that we really can't live our potential or our creative potential 
without a larger conversation with the world around us. In a very simple way, it's bringing in and including in these myriad of life forms, the elements, changing weather patterns, and having a sense of how these cycles really affect our human-dominated conversation. So where is the moon right now? But where is it in its lunar cycle? Just these simple awarenesses that take us beyond this very compelling human existence that we're living. That's wonderful. Have you read Ishmael? A long time ago. Yeah. We just read it in our book club. Oh, great. And um, it's reminding what you just said, reminded me of Ishmael. Let's go back about, you know, in your background, your childhood, your early experiences. What are some of the factors or perhaps even an aha moment, what it would be that led you in the direction of this work you're doing? Well, I was lucky enough to grow up on a farm. Yeah, growing up on a river. I always seem to live on rivers, which is not by design, but it somehow suits me. Growing up, you know, in the era before we only had two channels of TV and there wasn't any green time at all. There was no computers or devices in the house apart from this one fuzzy TV between five yeah. kids. So really we were part of what Richard Lou would call the last child in the woods, you know, that mm -hmm. generation that still grew up mm -hmm. close to nature and playing in the bamboo and tra with my tracking set, tracking for bear and <laughs> elephants down by the river. So I feel like I was given a pretty amazing dose of vitamin N nature time when I was a kid, oh, yeah. which set me up well. And when I left home and went to university in Sydney to study writing and communications, what I actually discovered was this environmental movement, which was completely alluring and completely new and exciting to me at the time. And it was an aha moment in a different kind of way when I actually realized as an adult that we are destroying the very life support systems upon which we rely. And there was a moment where I actually felt it in my body as some tragic awakening, this truth of the ecological crisis, of the perils of our times. And so from then on, I became a dedicated, committed conservationist and worked for many years in lots of different conservation organizations. And then towards the end of my 20s, I started to, well, there was kind of, there was an external and an internal pull going on Externally, what I started to realize was that the limitations of the success of the conservation movement were because people didn't have the connection or a love for these places that we were trying to protect. They didn't have an inherent love for the earth or a sense of deep connectedness that I'd kind of taken for granted. So I came to see in a way that unless there was that foundation of connection, it didn't matter how many statistics I threw at them about climate change or clear felling of forests. There was no fertile ground for it to fall on. And the other thing that started happening was a really strong internal pull towards more of like the mysteries of nature and psyche. So a pull towards spending lots of time alone in nature, learning about nature, like reconnecting myself back into mm -hmm. that animate force of life, the animate world. And this is also another aha moment came when I attended my first Earth Skills course in uh, primitive skills and nature observation and awareness. And something in me just woke up in a really profound way and, and just kind of grabbed hold of me and said, you must follow this thread. There's something here for you that is so compelling. And yeah. so that started me on the path that I'm now on, which was going deeper into eco-psychology and the human nature relationship, which took me into my year that I spent in the woods practicing wilderness survival skills and deep nature connection. And from there has flowed all of my work, all the work that I am now so passionate about how to reconnect people with a sense of themselves as part of this web of life and really coming home to a deep love for the earth, deep love for the planet. So many aha moments along the way, but I really feel like it was as much a movement of my own development that propelled me into this direction as much as an understanding of what the world needed in this time. So cool. I must say, my mom and I went to primitive skills. We call them gatherings here. Sure. A few years ago, we did not know what we were walking into. A friend of mine knew the person putting it on and I do camps and work with kids. And so they just hired me 
to help with the child care. And then my mom came to, to help. Mm-hmm. And we got there and we were like, whoa, what is this? And had a similar experience. Like, this mm-hmm. is just the coolest thing. Mm-hmm. And also I can tell you, Mary Kingsley is just turning green over your year in nature. Just yes. like her dream life. She's like, loves this. So I'm really fascinated about what you're saying, because what you're talking about with working for the conservation organizations and talking to people about caring for the environment and caring for the earth. And the thing that I perceive going on there is when we do that, we're like presenting things with this duality. We're just driving the wedge even more like there's us and there's nature and we need to take care of nature. Do you know what I mean? And what you're describing is sort of a personal next level thing of experiencing the oneness and the immersion I want to hear so much. I want to hear about, did you go to some program that was going on or is it something you did yourself, you invented yourself? Like, I'm just going to go out and immerse myself. Do you see what I'm saying? How we walk around talking about protecting the environment as if it's the separate thing from us. Yeah. The idea was planted when I I went over to the the United States actually and studied at Tom Brown G's Tracker School. Oh, the guy in New Jersey. In New Jersey. So I spent a couple summers over there studying with him and they have a caretaker program where it gives people the opportunity to dive deeply into all the skills that they've been learning and live on the land in primitive shelters, et cetera. And I just knew that I wanted to do that, but I wanted to do it here on this land with my plants and animals and mm-hmm. and there was nothing that was on offer in that way. So I kind of helped put together a program which friends of mine ended up running, calling it the Australia's first independent wilderness studies program. And it was cobbled together in a ramshackle way, but six of us landed on a private property that backed onto quite a lot of national park. And this was back in 2010. And it really was a project of self-initiated deep nature immersion. There weren't many rules, uh, just a sense of bring as little as you can and make the experience what you will. There was guest facilitators that would come in and teach us various skills. But for me, I was intent on turning my attention towards nature. I didn't really want to engage in human conversation very much. I wasn't particularly interested in human relationships. I was completely compelled to put my attention on the changing face of the bush and the changing face of my own internal landscape when I really immersed myself for four full seasons. So that's what I did. I made commitments. We all made our shelters by hand from just materials found in the forest. And I made a commitment to only lighting fires by rubbing sticks together. And pretty much my job description was the sacred order of survival, shelter, water, fire, and food. And my days were spent in a combination of introspection and journaling and taking care of my survival needs and also a lot of wandering time, a lot of observation and wandering time and just really steeping myself in the symphony of the forest and taking acute observation of what was moving around me and how it affected me. It was incredibly rich, powerful experience, which I just feel like such a privilege to have been able to to do and then write about. So there were other people out there with you, but you sort of chose not to interact very much, it sounds like. Yeah, the beginning stages of setting up our shelters and settling in was much more communal. But once I had my shelter built and I could move into it, I rarely shared a meal with anyone else. I really wanted to be alone. I just was in that really an initiatory phase of life, which called for a lot of solitude and it called for a kind of a fierceness to ensure that I was getting what I wanted, which was that really deep immersion time in nature. I just was not interested in the human conversation at all. Okay. I have so many questions. Okay. First of all, was this stressful? Were you, was it full survival mode really is what it is. And we use the term survival mode is like totally frenetic, right? And I'm wondering what that experience was like. Cause really you, I mean, this is, we talk about slow living on this podcast and it doesn't, does not get much slower than what you just We're... described. So I'm interested in like the stress level. Well, it wasn't full survival mode because we had, we were living on land that it couldn't support us just living primitively for a whole year in terms of food resources. 
because okay. most of the land in Australia, it's been significantly changed since Indigenous caretakership. So we had oats and lentils and dry okay. food to fall back on. I would certainly gather forage some of my food every day, but okay. it wasn't full survival living. I'm not okay. Not really a great hunter. I'm more of a forager. Okay. So I'd supplement my diet with foraged food. So it didn't have that reality TV show. Like, yeah, like naked and afraid is like what I'm thinking about. I was going to say alone without the TV cameras. <laughs> Yeah, well, it kind of had some of that element, but it didn't have that struggle piece to it. Okay. Uh, wow. I wasn't starving. So we sh it was just a different choice. You could choose to do that and really focus all your attention on food. But I really wanted to focus a lot of my attention on more of a that slow living. And mm -hmm. what happens when I take myself away from screens and devices and switch off completely? And like what actually happens to a Western mindset when you make that choice? So you didn't have a phone at all? No, didn't have a phone. Were there any points throughout the year that you like, was there a phone somewhere where you called your family or were you just... Yeah, there was, there was some contact. There was yeah. some contact and some trips into town to get more supplies. It wasn't com okay. completely cut off. Okay. Yeah. Just kind of a choose your own adventure, really, how yeah. to, to, to go into it. Well, I must say, in my senior year of college, we did a, a school-led 10-day canoe trip down the Rio Grande in Texas, on the border of Texas and Mexico. And it was 10 days. What is that? 10 nights? I don't know. Nine nights. No phones because literally they didn't work there at all anyway. And it would drain your battery and whatever. And you, we mm -hmm. just like, you know, turned them off, left them on the bus, whatever. I still, I don't know why I haven't just like done that again, but that was so transformative to me, to having 10 days without a screen mm -hmm. I, on top of, of course, camping every night and then being in that amazing landscape. Mm. If 10 days, I know exactly what that was like without the screen and how I felt like my brain changed even. <laughs> I can't even imagine mm. the whole year. Yeah. When you say your brain changed... I think, you know, our brain probably really does change with the use of all the screens and everything. Well, it absolutely does. I'm sure there's research on this, but can you describe that at all? Like what that felt like over days and weeks and months mm -hmm. of being like really disconnected from technology, from artificial communication for mm -hmm. that long? Yeah. I mean, it, it's like the frog in the slowly boiling water. You don't kind mm -hmm. of realize what's going on and until later down the track. But certainly in the initial stages, there was a bit of a feeling of detoxing from mm -hmm. culture. So that would manifest as trying to subtly control the situation, like lists and this is how much I want to get done, like a productivity mindset. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Which really broke me in a way after a few months. I was like, I can't live like this. I can't keep pushing myself in a kind of way that has these culturally conditioned benchmarks of how much I should be performing or getting done or what skills I should be mastering, et cetera. So that really forced a shift, a very intentional shift into just really slowing down and taking away any expectations about how I wanted to be out there and really turning towards more of the kind of feminine aspect, I guess, of like coming from what do I feel like doing right now mm -hmm. and letting go of the need to tick things off a list or and not try and guess what time it was and all that kind yeah. of thing. And all the kind of sit spots and slow wandering and tracking and nature observation I was doing and which really involves opening up the senses it was very sensitizing. So I became very aware, very sensitive, much more intuitive. There was a kind of fine tuning of my senses, which was a bit overwhelming when I came back into the world. And also what started to happen is I wanted a transformative experience, but of course we don't really know what that means until we're in it. And what started to happen in the depths of winter is a kind of breaking down of my identity or kind of dissolving of my social identity and cultural identity, which actually was quite terrifying. It was just that sense of, I don't know, all the walls of which I'd built up my identity kind of crumbling and the existential questions of well, who am I really? And lots of old emotional material coming up or old trauma moving through me from childhood that I didn't even know was there. A lot of old, just old gunk in this spaciousness that had the chance to mm. move. But at the time, it was really disorientating and quite terrifying. So there was 
lots of different shifts as part of it. And also what started to move as well was much a deeper connection with my psyche or soul. So in dreams and waking visions and my imagination became much more, my deep imagination, not fantasy per se, but the images in my psyche became a lot more vivid. And I started to have a much deeper kind of conversation with one of my teachers, Bill Plotkin, called my mythopoetic identity or who am I really at the heart, at the soul level of myself? And that's mm. what part of that year afforded me was that chance to drop beneath the level of white noise of our culture and, and ask these deeper questions and have them revealed through this silence. So jealous. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I was going to ask, did you experience like a really deep level of sleep? And you, you mentioned the dreaming, but did you feel your body's natural cycles really kick in? Mm, more definitely yeah I'm not a great sleeper in general especially when I'm in the city but out there it was long deep sleeps and very much in rhythm with the moon and in rhythm with the seasons so at this time of year winter solstice for me it was long long sleeps and full of dreams and I would write my dreams down and and start working with my dreams and certainly up first light and that's the, the time I loved getting up anyway and wandering listening, doing a sit spot, lighting a fire. Just the first few hours of the morning were really sacred time for me when I'd really tune in, deeply listen. Did you ever have a sense of like nothing to do? You talk about your to-do list and then when you, you began to shed that, did you have a feeling like, gosh, I have nothing to do? I was actually really scared of being bored at the start of the year. That was one of my main fears, that and things like not having a couch and not having a hot shower. And But that was really not something that I wasn't bored. I was just so full of, I guess, allurement is the word for the whole experience and the skills that I wanted to keep learning, just they're endless. They're lifetimes of mm -hmm. learning all these primitive skills and uncovering deeper and deeper layers of the ecology around me. So I, I didn't feel bored. I felt lonely sometimes, but not bored. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I imagine, especially when you like some of that emotional stuff you're talking about where in our Western world and the way that we're programmed is, you know, my immediate thought was like, oh, she probably needed a therapist. <laughs> you probably would have been helpful to process some of that stuff externally, but not being able to would have been an interesting experience too, I guess. Yeah. I mean, both. I'm sure it would have been helpful to have a therapist because to understand yeah. the form and how to move it through the body. And also the earth holds us. Yeah. Recesses and there's something, yeah, there's something very, I love love the sense of just letting the energy that needed to move through me move through me and mm -hmm. trust in that and not needing to process it necessarily in right that we know how in western or like and understand it i think that's part of our we have to understand everything yeah i have to rationalize that's part of our control mm -hmm. stuff yeah compartmentalize oh this means that yeah, yeah. i mean some framework would have been helpful but the understanding came later yeah <laughs> You got your couch and your therapist later <laughs> yeah. at the same time. <laughs> Speaking of later, you, you mentioned a little earlier that it was hard, that the sensory input was really hard to take later on. So let's go to your emerging from this mm -hmm. immersion experience and what's that like? And then it leads you into this other work. Mm. You want to get up to some of that. Mm -hmm. What was it like leaving your immersion. Yeah. Re-entry. Yeah, re-entry. Mm. I mean, re-entry was tough. Yeah, it was really tough. It wasn't a process that had finished in 12 months. Mm -hmm. It had its own timeline that extended beyond that. And I tried writing about it straight away when I got out. I just had this clear sense that I needed to write about my experience. I was still kind of like caterpillar mush in the cocoon. I hadn't warmed mm. to the butterfly yet. So it was really dancing with that sense of wanting to write about it, but I was still in the experience itself and just reacquainting myself with being on a laptop and getting my first smartphone and couldn't really go back to the life I had been living. Yeah, integration was definitely tough and that's really where I needed good support and people who yeah. understood the process I'd been through, which very few people do and did. I imagine there must have been a sense of grief about it. Yeah, I also had a lot of grief. Yeah. Leaving my shelter, it had really become sacred ground for me and leaving my sit spot and, and leaving 
just the depth of that life, you know, just the richness of it. Points. You know. Do you ever think about what if you didn't? What if you just stayed out there forever? I had those fantasies when I was out there, but yeah, there was a sense that all good journeys need to come to an end and the story needs yeah. to be told. Did you have this sense that after you experienced that and felt the sacredness of it, and then you come back in the world and you see all these humans mm. living on this other level. Does that, I don't mean to over dramatize, but does that seem kind of tragic? <laughs> yeah, I know what you're pointing to, I think, is just that really harsh juxtaposition of such a deep, sensitive life that in many ways felt so true for this nervous mm -hmm. system, this mm. yeah. wild human, this unconditioned self felt so right to live in that way and then to come back into such a fast-paced disconnected world there was a lot of grief in that knowing that I had to find a place within that again and knowing body way not just an intellectual way how far we've strayed from our evolutionary roots how much we're missing in our lifestyle and that's it certainly was a place of grief for me for quite a long time but I also you know I have got the heart of a social activist so I want to do something about it mm. I'm not someone who just wants to disappear in homestead I I really want to be engaged in cultural regeneration and cultural emergence. So you came out of this experience and how did you begin reaching out mm. to people? And was it a new way? Did you blossom into the butterfly with the whole new mission, switching from your conservation organizations to more of this heart-centered, soul-centered experience that you, from that came your work? Yeah, I mean, it all happened in quite an organic way. There wasn't really any strategic business plan or anything, but I just followed one step after the other. And the first step was knowing I needed to write about the experience, which after a long and arduous process did turn into my first memoir, My Year Without Matches. And from the release of that book, there was quite a lot of attention and interest and curiosity in the experience. And when people started to really hear about what I'd been experiencing, they wanted a piece of it themselves, of course. So then came a lot of invitations to start teaching and engaging. And that's where Nature's Apprentice came from, was to really meet the needs of the times of the people who really wanted to learn some of these skills that I'd been learning and for me to have an opportunity to develop some delivery systems that could go some way to to meeting this need. So I started guiding Vision Quest, which I'd been trained in some years before and running rewilding classes and women's retreats that involved earth skills and solo time out on the land and just trying out and experimenting all these different ways of bringing in the classic kind of trajectory of the hero's journey in a way, like now it's the time for giving. Now it's the time for like mm -hmm. bringing the treasures back to the tribe in a way. What I wasn't expecting was moving back to the city, which I did about seven years ago, moved to Melbourne and really found a whole new challenge of integrating such a wild experience into a city landscape, which then became the subject of my memoir that got published last year, which was Rewilding the Urban Soul, How to Bring the Wild Back to the City, which I certainly wasn't planning on living myself but it's been such an incredible experiment in okay you know most of us live in urban environments we don't all have the privilege of living out in the woods for a year so how do we bring some of these practices and experiences back how do we cultivate a wild mind and a wild heart in these urban centers so that's been my project of the last seven years oh can you give us a little taste of that or we just have to go read the book <laughs> Yeah, I guess one of the stories I'll relay is I started running a group here in, in like an urban parkland over a couple of years, a group we called Rewild Fridays. And so it was my way of going, oh, let's see what could happen in like, you know, with a regular group that just meets between school hours on a Friday. So a group that was pretty much a core group of stable folk turned up every Friday. And in these urban parklands, we'd do all the skills that I was doing out in the bush. So all the basket weaving and hide tanning and string making and fire, fire friction and learning natural movement, nature observation awareness, doing all the sit spots and the bird language and all those kinds of skills. And what I found was that this group went really deeply into the skills and started to develop a really strong sense of connection. They started doing some of the practices at home. 
down in their backyards or local parks. But it was something to do with the regularity and the village structure of like sharing the stories and, and sharing the challenges and keeping each other accountable to this whole project of deep nature connection. And some of them really had profound shifts in their sense of relatedness and belonging and started sensitizing that we were doing during those Fridays would translate into their like osteopathic practices or their work in different ways that was really unexpected. And it really showed me how these core routines of nature connection, as one of my other teachers, John Young, calls them, they really are transferable, translatable to different environments. It's not about turning back the clock to hunter-gatherer society. It's really about integrating them as much as we can wherever we live. Because wildness, not wilderness, but wildness is everywhere. It's all around mm. us. Weeds, edible weeds coming through the cracks in the pavement. It's the changing weather patterns. It's birds that are always telling us something. And it's just how much we choose to tune into that. Gosh, that's such an important message because you know, I think perhaps the average person listens to something like this and feels like it's completely inaccessible or it doesn't apply to them or they're too far down the rabbit hole of 21st century urban existence. Mm. But just to know that it is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. We can't escape nature, mm. actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can't escape the oxygen and the soil, or the ground we're walking on and trees, and we can't escape needing to eat, all those things. But we don't think about that. We think about connecting with nature means going for a walk in the woods or whatever. So I'm curious to know that in your work, and you just described that story, but when people come to you, they come to your workshops, they come to your classes and weekends and these things. What are the common threads you see in people that come to you? Yeah. I mean, there are definitely common threads and most people who come have a sense of longing and longing is a really powerful currency. Mm because it draws you closer to what you're longing for, but it's it's got this quality of knowing that there's something out there that you're seeking. And that longing is generally around belonging. It's a longing for belonging. And that's on multiple levels. It's belonging to community. It's belonging to something larger than themselves, to some sense of connectivity with the wider world, the wilder world. And so they're seeking more aliveness. They're seeking a sense of self-reliance or some more original way of being on the land and knowing that there's an emptiness involved in just being a consumer in consumer culture. So there's a hunger in them to be able to engage with the land and engage with the community in a, in a much more visceral, real, raw way. And that makes it really easy for me to respond to because so when people come with that kind of longing, then I can really meet them there because I resonate with it and understand it. And it's an ongoing hunger in myself for finding more and more ways for deeper connectivity. What is a vision quest? Vision quest, well, it's a pan, kind of pan-cultural ceremony. It's most well-known in Native American culture, but it also exists in lots of other cultures around the world. And it's essentially a period of solo fasting out on the land in a kind of ceremonial container. That's the kind of bare bones of what it really is. It's usually part of some kind of rite of passage or initiatory period of life. And it's a ceremony that seeks healing, seeks clarity, seeks spiritual growth. It's a kind of humbling of oneself in the eyes of the creator spirit or the great mystery. It's like a strong gesture that you can make out there on the land to come into greater connection with, with yourself and your path. And it's yeah, very powerful, very simple, but very powerful practice that I've found. And that's part of your workshop offering, right? Yeah. We like to run a couple of vision quests a year. And one of my favorite times of the year is guiding people on such a sacred journey. And how long is it over a weekend or a week? It's usually an 11 day program of which four days and four nights is spent out on the land in prayer in solo fast. Wow. Yeah. And fasting, you mean no food? No food. That water, drinking water. Okay. Do you have to like train for that? Like, what is that like not eating for four days? Or you can just do it. We do certainly recommend in the preparation phase, the months leading up to it, some practice fasts and 24 hour fasts and simplifying mm -hmm. and purifying the diet. So there's more of an easeful entry, not spending the whole time detoxing. Right. Mm -hmm. So fascinating. I want to ask you a question like, considering, you know, what we're facing now as mm -hmm. humans on this planet. 
what do you perceive is like our biggest threat to healing? What's our obstacle to being able to keep moving forward here? Obviously, runaway climate change is right in our faces Mm -hmm. as the most urgent and prominent and all-encompassing environmental threat and we need to turn our attention to it Mm -hmm. and so I hope that there's a sense of holding that urgency and the need to engage with that right now with also this deeper longer slower but just as important kind of shifting values and shifting consciousness which is back into that state of wild mind and reanimation of our psyches, Mm. which really is going to sustain the kind of shift to a life-affirming culture that we know we need. So while we need to tend to the urgent requirements of slowing down runaway climate change, we also need to tend to reimagining our place in the family of things. And that feels just as urgent, but it's a longer campaign, that one, to bring back the endangered species of the wild human. Yeah, so true. The long game versus the what do we have to do right now? Yeah, and tending to both, you know, really bringing yeah. both into the work that we're doing is what I'm inquiring into at the moment, how to tend to both. I wanted to plant that phrase in my brain, reimagining our place in the, what did you say? I think I said the family of things. Family of things. Reimagining our place in the family of things. Yes. Mm, that's that's cool. amazing. Yeah. And what brings you hope in all of it? I like to borrow Joanna Macy's phrase, active hope. Joanna Macy, mm-hmm. the incredible activist over there in California. Mm -hmm. She talks about active hope being not wishful thinking, but the hope that comes from purely engaging with what we know is life affirming. So waking up each day and choosing the path of life affirmation Mm -hmm. and engaging with change in our own particular ways, which for me right now is this work in deep reconnection. And that gives me hope that I found my ecological niche in what I love to do. And so I'm fully engaged in my role in the world. That's hopeful to me. Mm. And getting to have conversations with so many other people who are on that path feel like my work is inherently hopeful because it's really it's really tending, tending to the fires of the seven generations from here. And I take my hat off to people who are engaged in more of the cold face of climate change activism. And yeah. so of course that work can be so full of burnout. And that's why these places of deep reconnection and ceremony and wildness and aliveness are so important to keep our wellspring alive of hope and vision. Well, we always ask our guests what slow living means to them. And you've obviously had a year of the ultimate slow living and a lot of work with that concept in your own life and helping others with it. But what would you say to others, our listening audience, about slow living and people that are feeling led by their life instead of leading their life? Does that make any sense? How, what would you say about slow living? It's an illusion to think any of us are really able to live in a slow way that our ancestors yeah. knew about. And did like it's just not practical for us. We're engaging with this project of shifting the wheel of culture towards life affirmation. That takes a lot of work. And so for me, it's it's really savoring those slow moments in the day. And just like I talked about the sacred morning time when I was out mm. here in the woods, I also need an hour or two in the morning where I'm not on devices, where I'm really tending to that conversation with the more than human world, where I'm not talking to humans and my attention is really on the visible and invisible realms that are beyond the human. And that for me sets a foundation for my day, which is just vitally important. If I roll into the day without that time, then I find myself scrambling and kind of losing center. So it's really during those moments. And usually for me, it's, you know, bookends of the day, the kind of dawn and dusk where that time's really important. What about the good dirt? What does the good dirt mean to you? Well, it's interesting because Tom Brown Jr., who I studied with the tracker, he had this phrase, dirt time. Mm -hmm. And he would say it a lot, you know, it's like, it's all about dirt time, which is really, it's the grist of learning the skills. So when you, when I hear about the good dirt, podcast I just think of dirt time it's not the talking about it it's the doing of it the doing it and the messing up and the yeah, yeah and the yeah I love that that's so cool yeah my whole life yeah, feels like dirt, dirt time yeah. <laughs> that's awesome 
Claire, this has been such a joy. It's been so lovely chatting yes. with you. Sure. Is there anything else that you want to leave us with today or especially let us know and let listeners know? You've mentioned your book titles a couple of times, but where else they can find you and follow you? And Yeah, well, check out my website, naturesapprentice.com.au and there's opportunities there to engage and keep in contact. And I'd love to hear some of the stories of listeners and how this has resonated so that's a great way to find me you guys after you listen to this you can call our voicemail number it's in our show notes you can tell us what you think of this episode and tell claire your story and then we'll yes then we'll be able to play it back to her and your books are rewilding the urban soul and my year without matches okay very cool Thank you so much. This was a fascinating, wonderful conversation. Really appreciate your time. And we'll be in touch about when it's coming out and all those things. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation and pleasure to chat to you both. Okay, Claire. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. You too. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in, calling in, and spreading the good dirt. We love hearing from you. You can reach our listener voicemail at 443-459-1950. That's 443-459-1950. You can find this number in our show notes and in our Instagram profile. This show is produced by Lady Farmer, a slow living lifestyle community. And the original music is composed and performed by John Kingsley. For more from Lady Farmer, follow us on Instagram at wearladyfarmer. That's We Are Lady Farmer. Or join us online at www.ladyfarmer.com. We'll see you next time on The Good Dirt. Goodbye. Goodbye.